we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, for those of you who just walked in, I have some slides because I was made, it was required. So that's why there's slides. So I don't care if I don't get through them, please feel free to interrupt if you have questions. I'll repeat them because I think we've got some viewers from outside the room. Um, but other than that, uh, I'll just start off with a little bit of introduction. A little bit of an introduction just for credibility's sake. Uh, so I've been in this game for about 20 years. I was a contracting officer at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency for a little over 13. Uh, we were directed to implement SAFE, be safe. Um, nobody really knew what it was, but they were certain you couldn't do it under the federal acquisition regulations. Uh, I owned all the application service contracts, and so it was kind of my job to figure out how to do it. And I did, after a lot of uh, failed attempts, like Edison, I guess. Um, I finally stumbled across a couple models that actually worked. And from there, I got asked to co-author the TechFAR handbook, which was the first publication on how to buy Agile under the FAR. Uh, and then shortly after, recruited to US Digital Service in the early days, uh, back when it was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I, I ended up staying for four and a half years unexpectedly, went over to Defense Digital Service for three of those years, uh, and then left to go help do a tech startup. And uh, now I'm doing consulting kind of full time, as joined along the way, uh, working with government agencies and companies that are trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, so I like to do that. I like to talk to people. So if you have questions after this, feel free to follow up. Uh, I just enjoy the topic a lot because, as I've mentioned before, I'm a nerd. So uh, nerds like to talk about things they know. So uh, let's get going. So let's start with the big picture. Uh, so we, we've talked a bit about bureaucracy. We just had a conversation on a book written by friends of mine all about hacking your bureaucracy. And for a long time, my title was Bureaucracy Hacker. Um, but I'm gonna make maybe a contrary statement. I don't think bureaucracies are inherently bad, okay? Um, you actually need bureaucracies to run large organizations. Anyone who's been in a startup, which I've talked to a few people, you're in startups, right? Uh, when you first join a startup and there's like 10 of you, you don't need a lot of rules, right? It, this is Joe, Joe's not gonna do anything stupid. Like he's you know, an owner of the business. But when you start scaling, you get to 100, 200 people, suddenly you might not know Joe, and Joe might have gotten through the hiring and emotional criteria just fine, but he thinks taking a limo to dinner is a good idea. So you have travel rules, right? Uh, so when, when is bureaucracy bad? It's bad when it impedes your ability to deliver on the mission, right? And Adam gave a great lecture last night. If you didn't see it, it was incredible. Uh, but he really talked about how like, the bureaucracy that we're operating in is sort of unchangeable. It's, it's by design. And I think that's a great point. And so we have to just affect the things we can affect. Control your own environment as much as you can. Um, and so how do we do that? We have to understand our environment. Well, one thing I understand is that most people actually want to do good. Most civil servants and military folk want to do the right thing. They're there for a reason. Uh, and it's usually not a paycheck, because they could probably do better elsewhere. Uh, and, and where you really see it is you kind of got the, the frontline people. You know, they care because it actually affects their day-to-day -to -day life, right? Like hand jamming all this information into spreadsheets is a pain in the ass. They don't want to do it. They know there's an easier way. And then you got leadership who stands up on top and it's like, you know, saying all the right words. We're going to do AI. We're going to do acquisition better. Uh, they, they care if, if for nothing else because they're public facing. They have to care. Uh, and then you got like the squishy middle, right? The people who are worried about the career arc and, you know, I don't want to look bad. And the best way for me not to look bad is to not make my boss look bad. So that's really where the work happens, right? Because you can convince the, the frontline person, but they don't have any money. You can convince the senior person who might theoretically have the money, but really has no control over where it goes. It's, it's getting into that middle layer and getting buy-in. And, and the best way to get buy-in is to show them where it's been done before without an issue. Um, because people are risk averse and have a fear of change. They think modern technology approaches are dangerous. New cybersecurity, open source code, uh, agile delivery. They, they imagine just a bunch of engineers in a dark room with Red Bull and computers just willy nilly typing whatever they want. Uh, but the funny thing is the GAO has been writing almost every year for the last decade that waterfall acquisitions fail 90% of the time by cost schedule and performance. So they're envisioning a world where they're not taking risk by doing probably the most risky thing, where there's only a 10% chance of success. And you can use that to your advantage, because you can show them, well, here's other places we've done this, and it's been successful. And then we get to these procurement people. God help us, right? Uh, the no people, right? That's kind of the mentality. Why, why do we think of the contracting officer like that? 
Uh, I, I was kind of saying before, you know, they're the tail that wags the dog. Most of the time, they have no idea all these conversations that industry has had with the requirement owner. They don't really understand the requirement owner's problem. They had this thing dropped on their desk and they're told to do it. And they're risk adverse. Why are they risk adverse? Well, about 20 years ago when I got into contracting, buying laptops off of BPA, most awful job in the world, um, what was I told? I was told my job is to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse. And I was personally and professionally liable for anything that I did. Holy shit. I was a kid. I wasn't making any money. I had a mortgage, and I'm like going to go to jail. One of my COs told me, uh, you should really get liability insurance for this job. <laughs> I said, absolutely not. I can barely pay my mortgage. But, um, but that's the mentality. And so people come into contracting, and they look to their COs, and their COs do things a certain way, and they're like, OK, I'm going to do exactly what they do, because I don't want to get in trouble. There's no innovation there. And uh, you know, I, I personally think, and I have since the beginning, that contracting isn't really the job. That's the bullshit paperwork that you have to do to do the job. The real job of a contracting officer is to be a business advisor. And a business advisor is a professional who deeply understands their craft and understands what their customer is buying, so they're part of the solution. Uh, and their job's not to say no. It might be no, but we can do it this way. Uh, it's, it's to get help get to the mission. That's the whole point of a contracting officer. And people don't necessarily have that philosophy. So a big part of those of you that are selling into the government is finding those contracting officers that think that way. And they are out there. All right, so just a little bit of context here. I keep looking up there. It's right in front of me. Um, yeah, it's not used, I'm not used to it. Uh, OK, so contracts. You know, We were talking a little bit about bureaucracy and a startup versus a scaled business or a scaling business. You know, contracts didn't used to be that complex. You know, it was basically just like, we don't want this person giving a $100 million contract to their brother. Like, that's the kind of thing we want to stop. But then people screw up, and they take advantage, and we make a rule. And then somehow they screw up that rule, so they make another rule and another rule. And now we have 2,368 pages of rules in the FAR. Fun fact, the FAR really only tells you no about three times. The rest of it is supposed to be instructions on how you can do things. But just like you know, programming a VCR back in the 90s, you know, those instructions are a bit confusing. You have to understand them. But they really are a pathway to do things. People just assume, I got to do it the way people always did it. But the fact is, there's all kinds of pathways within the, within the FAR to get things done. Uh, so things started getting complex, not just because of all the rules, but technology was changing. You, know, you didn't actually have to be that creative when you had two years lead time to write your requirement. You had a year to run the acquisition and five to 10 years to deliver because you probably weren't going to be in that job anymore, right? It was just basically, you know, this is the start to finish. We're going to hand it to the contractor. They're going to lay out a map, and they're going to follow that map. 90% of the times they don't, but that's what we believed when we put the contract in place. But technology, technology kind of threw a monkey wrench in that. You know, open source code, like, what do we do with it? Is it safe? Are we allowed to use it? Open architectures. We don't want to be open. We want to protect our data. You know, it started creating a lot of complexity. And then recently, and I say recently, over 10 years ago, people started getting it, right? We've got to be more efficient. We've got to keep up with our, uh, our uh, adversaries around the world. We've got to be able to keep up with industry. And so uh, you started to see these pockets kind of come up, US Digital Service, 18F. Uh, Kessel Run, AFWORK. So there are pockets out there. Uh, and it's not just in the DOD, believe it or not. There's other agencies. I work with other agencies that are trying really hard to get this right. I mean, we hear of the, the big ones like VA and CMS that have been doing this for a long time. But the other agencies are trying to come along. OK, so I talked about innov innovation. This is my personal, I don't want to call it a definition because I don't think it meets the definition of a definition. But this is my personal mantra of innovation. Innovation is assuming anything can and should be done differently. It involves a deep understanding of the rules, regulations, and policies, procedures, and case law that surrounds the thing you want to change. And it requires responsible risk taking. And see, the catch is you can't do the third one without the second one. And this is where people, this is what people miss. They're just like, I want to do things differently. Cool. How do you want to do it? Oh, I want to do this thing. All right, here's why you can't do that. Now, my job and people like me, our job is to explain how you can do what you're trying to do. What's the intent? And so it just, it, it's, it's nerd stuff, man. If, you, if you're writing code, you know, you got to understand code. You just have to know your craft. It's like anything else. And, and with this kind of philosophy, I've been able to apply it all across acquisitions. But I've also applied it in lots of other ways with helping businesses grow. Because people kind of get stuck in their box. Because they don't understand the playing field. 
how far can you go to the right and left before you go off the bridge, right? What are your boundaries? And those boundaries are usually really far, especially in acquisitions, no pun intended, if you caught that. All right, um, <laughs> so how does that apply to acquisitions? Well, it's process innovation. And this is interesting to me because when we talk about acquisition innovation, most people get really stuck on the pre-acquisition part. How do we run acquisitions better? It's actually not that hard. We make it hard, but it's not that hard. And I think there's a lot of, of work out there that has demonstrated this can be done better. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. Like we've, we've seen it, right? Like the CSOs, the OTAs, uh, you know, the SIBRs, the way uh, the Air Force is using the SIBRs, there's lots of stuff out there. There's strategic integration, bringing the team together, you know, how do we bring tools into the process? But what I really wanna focus on for a moment is the outcome oriented. I think this is so important. Megan mentioned it last night, and I love that she said it in the way she put it. She said, Out outcome versus outputs. And so when we structure a contract pre and in ex for execution, uh, historically, we, we have this iron triangle for contracting. We have cost, period of performance, and scope. And only a contracting officer can change those things. So shall it be. So is how shall it's done, right? So those are the rules. And that doesn't change. And I'm not proposing we change it. That's right. But what we've done historically is we've tied the technical requirements to those contractual requirements. We had integrated master schedules. I've had a 500 page system requirement document tied to the contract. So if you wanted to change from and to the, that was a contract modification. That takes time and it's not a high priority one. So it's gonna sit there. Uh, we, we put our shall statements in 50 pages, statements of work. You wanna change one thing in there your priority change, your user isn't happy, cool. Contract modification, more cost, more time. That's the only way you're gonna do it. And so how do we separate those? Well, what we do is we say, tech folks, you live inside that triangle. But instead of attaching your schedule, your backlog, which was normally a bunch of shall statements and a statement of work, those are your documents. You can change those anytime you want, as long as you don't increase the period of performance, you don't increase the time, and you don't change the scope. And that scope piece is where everybody gets hung up. What's the scope? That's why we use statements of objectives now primarily, as opposed to statements of work. Here's our overarching objective and performance work statements, the process the vendor's gonna use. Most times I have the vendors write the performance work statement. How would you deliver it? Because I don't wanna compare apples to apples. I wanna compare apples to oranges, to bananas, and pineapples. You know, let's see what industry can bring and solve our problems. Uh, this works really well. Statements of objectives are easy to write. They're much shorter, and it gives a lot more flexibility. Uh, so we'll continue that down this path here. So why, is it, why should it be less complicated? Well, again, because we're buying the outcome. We're buying the repeatable process for the delivery of a functional product. We're buying the factory. That's where that term software factory came from. Um, maybe people don't love it anymore. But the original idea of a software factory was that phrase I just said. We're buying, uh, if you read Shel Silverstein, the homework machine, right? We just want to put my requirement in. I want a process to occur. I'll pay for that process but I want an output. I want an output, but I'm not gonna tell you what that is. That output is gonna be worked at the technical level. It's gonna meet a definition of done, of course. Everybody's gonna have to accept it. Uh, but it makes it a lot simpler to articulate to industry what you're trying to buy. That's a little bit different if you're buying a commercial product, which we should be doing more of. Um, but in that case, again, we're not defining the specific salient characteristics of that specific product. We should be describing the outcome. The product should meet the outcome. So as I mentioned, there's all sorts of ways we've been creative. Uh, CSOs, so if you don't know, CSOs came out of the 2016 NDAA when OT kind of got reborn, right? And DIU uh, was a big part of that. And it was this couple things they added to it. They added that it was also for prototypes because it used to just be for basic and applied and advanced research. They added end prototypes, super important, because DIU said, well, you know, when you're developing software, an MVP is like a prototype which isn't exactly true, but for the purposes of legislation and statute, it was a great use of words. Uh, but they also recognized that uh, other transaction authority is outside the FAR. Unfortunately, or fortunately, all the contract types are inside the FAR. All the acquisition approaches are inside the FAR. So they were kind enough to add the com commercial solutions opening. What does it look like? They modeled it right after the BAA, the Broad Agency Announcement, FAR Part 35, which is research and development contracting, which, by the way, is the most fun kind of contracting. We did it for a while. Um, so o OTAs and CSOs. CSOs are now done 
under FAR contracting, primarily by GSA. The main difference between the two is that under OTAs, you can kick people out anytime you want. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for industry. You want to get kicked out early if you're not going to win. You don't want to put in a lot of documentation. We'll talk about down selects in a minute. Um, and it's good for evaluators. Uh, but you can, under FAR-based contracting, the CSOs, you can do an advisory down select. So basically, you can say, you're probably not going to win. Up to you if you want to keep submitting content and coming to orals and doing code challenges or whatever. Uh, but we're telling you, you're, you're not going to, probably not going to win. And so most times, industry will get the hint and bow out gracefully. That reduces risks of protest. I would save that for a longer presentation, since most of you are not contracts people. Uh, but it does decrease the risk of protest as well. All right, so we talked about some of this stuff already. Uh, but you know, market research is a big one. Uh, most people, when they think FAR contracting, they're actually thinking FAR 15, which is contract by negotiations. Fun fact, the whole section besides the title doesn't even talk about negotiations. They talk about discussions. Um, FAR 15 is actually a great. It's, a, it's really well written. It's a good way to run an acquisition. Unfortunately, that's where all the really big acquisitions were done. That's where all the really big protests were won and lost. And so that's where all the case law is that tells you how you got to do it to avoid future protests. And uh, that's why it's complicated. So there's, as I mentioned, there's lots of other sections of the FAR where it's a lot easier. The good thing is FAR 15 is the only part that really talks about limitations on communications with industry. All the other 8.4, 12, 13, uh, 35, uh, yeah, uh, 16.5. None of those sections, you all know what those are, right? Of course. Uh, I could have said any number, so it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> I just made all that up. Um, but none of those sections really limit you. In fact, FAR Part 10 is market research, and all the whole section is about actually engaging with industry. So not only should contracting officers and program offices be taking advantage of that, there's no instructions on how to do it. It just says do it. It gives you some recommendations. But you are allowed to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with industry. You're allowed to do it. You should do it. Because when you get a whole bunch of industry people in a room and you talk about a requirement, they're not going to raise their hand and say it's bullshit. They're not going to tell you where you did something stupid. And they're certainly not going to ask a really good question because they're afraid someone's going to steal their secret sauce. Uh, but you can pull them in one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation with them. It might be more them talking to you. But you can talk to them. You can have that conversation. And you should. It makes a huge difference. Um, down selections. I love down selections. Why do I love down selections? Has to do with protests. Has to do with what I just talked about. And, and I kind of say it this way. The amount of effort from industry and evaluators should be commensurate with each offer, offer's likelihood of success. It's a lot of words. What does it mean? It means if, I if you're one in n number of proposals, you shouldn't have to spend $100,000 of BMP dollars to compete on this thing. Yes, sir. Can you say, I don't, I don't know what DTS is. Is that defense travel system? It is defense travel system. Can, can you tell me more about down, down selection and growth of the DTS? Uh, yes, actually, I can. So I actually led for four miserable years of my life. It was a great opportunity. I led uh, the modernization effort at DOD for defense. <laughs> No, sir. I was responsible for the modernization of DTS, <laughs> implementing a commercial solution, uh, which subsequently, recently, has been killed because of bureaucracy. Uh, but I've been long gone. Defense Travel System is the perfect example of archaic bad systems that were built exactly how the government asked it. The contractor did nothing wrong. They did absolutely nothing wrong. Uh, and believe me, I've read every document associated with Defense Travel System. Um, they built to spec exactly what the government asked for. So how did we modernize it? And I'm going to just pretend it hasn't been can canceled since I left. But why I was there, this was a great moment in time. Um, so how do we do it? So first thing we did is I came in uh, at the direction of the uh, DepSecDef and studied the problem for two weeks. I was like, OK, what are the problems? Same problems there always are. Communication, people, and process. That's always the problem. It's rarely technology. Well, in this case, it was also technology. Uh, one cool thing is the contract actually had a, a modernization CLIN on it that they weren't using. Go figure. Right? You could tell anyone who's ever traveled under DTS knows they haven't been using the defense or modernization CLIN. So we did a pilot under the modernization. We did, a, we did a selection under that existing contract, brought in Concur commercial solution, not the bullshit GSA one that you use if you ever did civil government work. Um, they did a pilot, really simple. We took the big, huge travel regulations. We shortened it down to five pages, basic, basic travel, 
CONUS, less than 30 days, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, we did a pilot, it worked. And so then we used a consortium and ran a down selection with, for a commercial travel solution. Uh, we did um, a five-page white paper, I think it was, and then we did orals, and then we did uh, price negotiation. Yes, sir. Can you describe how you got the consortium? Was that something you assisted or just a, a organized? <laughs> um, one of my fantasies is I'm going to create a consortium. <laughs> so there's a lot of consortiums out there, and uh, this one existed, it was C5 Consortium. So we went through Army Picatinny to the C5 Consortium. Um, my problem... Oh, sorry. My personal problem with consortiums is anybody can join a consortium. You don't have to be good. You have to have $500 and can fill out a form. That's what it takes. And so when they run these acquisitions, anybody can apply. And I actually went to them and I said, hey, I would like to help you evaluate vendors by a certain criteria, create a subset of your consortium. Like, absolutely not. It violates our consortium agreement with our members. So I'd like to create one that actually does that. But that's neither here nor there. Um, so we went to them, gave them our requirement. They took way too long, right? Like, I mean, it went through all the, this is why I don't generally care for the way the consortiums work. Went through all the maturations it would if I just went to a CO. The only advantage is we didn't have to find a CO willing to do this. Was, was it an OT consortium? It was an OT consortium, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we did a down select. We ended up also ending up with Concur. Not that it was baked, it just, they had, they did the pilot and they had all the requirements. So, um, okay, any other questions on this or anything else? Right, we'll move on here. So streamline documentation, you know, make things easier, reduction in paperwork. Um, why don't we use forms? Why do we ask vendors to write out big, long papers? I mean, I, I've, done, I've actually did this using OT authority where we used a Google form. And we're like, upload your repositories. Give us screenshots. You know, do this you know, where have you worked. And we made our, our down selection process just through that. So then we had conversations with the two or three vendors we selected from there, which is why OT is good. Tools and templates are great. I might talk about this on another slide, but I don't have a lot of time, so I'll throw it in here. Uh, acquisitions is going to totally change. Orals, I think I have orals on here? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, orals are going to become the future of acquisitions. Why? Because AI is replacing the, yep. the need to be able to write proposals really well. No offense to proposal writers. Uh, you probably use them, right? Like, it's like, hey, I could just jam this in here real quick and re-say it for me. And that's totally fine. And why the hell isn't the government using it to generate requirements? Here's my bulleted list of objectives. Chat GPT, make me a paragraph. So this is happening. I know lots of companies. I'm, I'm sort of talking to a lot, lot of companies that are building software specifically for this problem. They are actually trying to remove the burdensome effort of writing proposals. Right now, it's like, hey, we'll serve you up the 80% solution. You do the 20%, which is what AI should do, right? It should. Have the human do the human part of it, but get rid of all that manual stuff. Uh, so orals are going to make a huge difference. It also makes a huge difference because a lot of companies have professional proposal writers that are really good at telling a story. And I do a lot of oral coaching for companies, and I'll sit down with the team, and they're required to be the people who are going to perform in the first session, and most of them have never read the proposal. Maybe they gave a paragraph like three months ago, but they never read what's actually being submitted. And a lot of times, that's the case, right? So you're buying a piece of paper. You're never actually meeting the people that are going to deliver. And so orals are going to change everything. Uh, it's not going away. Code challenges are cool. They're fun. It's a great way to evaluate a team's process and how they deal with stress and uh, how they can write code. But what I always tell government agencies is, do you understand code? Do you know the difference between good code and bad code? Because if you don't, why are you wasting their time? You know, you could just get the visual, you could evaluate the UX maybe, but you can't evaluate the code, don't waste your time. So either hire someone who understands code or hire a contractor to be a subject matter expert on your code evaluation. So I do not think code challenges are replacing proposals. I think that'll be a useful tool for organizations that are set up to actually properly evaluate it. All right, running short on time here, what's important? On the training and education, so we have the DITAP program. I helped create it. I still teach it. I think it's an awesome course. A lot of people come out of that actually kind of understanding this from the CO level. What we don't really have is like standardized training for cores and product owners. So many times in agencies I see product owners or program managers last night when they went to bed and magically they made a wish upon a star and they're a product owner. No training. They don't understand how to do it. And now they have all the responsibility, theoretically, of being the single empowered person to make technical decisions. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And it causes complete ruckus. Most of the times when I see agile programs fail, it's because the product owner doesn't understand their job. 
The only other reason, general other reason, is a senior leader doesn't understand the product owner's job and they keep sticking their nose in it and telling them what's more important. Um, so getting the right training, leadership, product owners, I think is super important. Uh, I talked a lot about that. So, Oh, actually, no, I will mention this. So, you know, integrated product teams isn't a new thing. It's been around forever. And when we do Agile, you know, we're, we're all about this tight-knit team. So I work with the SEC uh, supporting their acquisitions, and one of the things we do is we start way early. We bring the whole team together. I sit down, I do workshops with them on a product vision. I do workshops on their statements of objectives. And every single time, all the owners of the requirement are in complete disagreement about what they're buying. <laughs> so just imagine if they didn't get that kind of white glove treatment, what they would have sent out there, someone would have been disappointed with the solution. Uh, regulatory reviews had a great conversation the other night about uh, just sort of a lot of the ambiguity in terms like commercialization and cibers. What the hell does that mean? I mean, I know what it means and I know how to use it, but a lot of people are like commercialization. Is that a certain percentage of my sales are to commercial business? No, you can just sell it to anybody else not using cibber funds. That meets the definition. But it's a very confusing word. So we need to actually clean up a lot of language. That's long-term stuff. The Hill's super open to it, so I do a lot of conversations with them trying to fix that. I think I'm out of time. Oh, good. I'm out of slides. Look at that. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate you coming. Uh, it, like I said, if you have any questions, I think I have my. Con Ooh, look at that slide. That's a piece of crap. Um, it, uh, John Most on uh, LinkedIn. Feel free to like connect, and I'm happy just to like talk through if you're having like an issue or whatever. But I appreciate you all coming. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.